Good morning. We're here on day 106. Our topic today is walking with Jesus. We're going to look at uh, Luke 24 and John 20. And just to catch everyone up to remind us, we've been going through the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the burial and then resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to see in the post-resurrection encounters uh, now. So on the, raid to, on the road to Emmaus is our topic today. Behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus which was about 60 stadia, or seven miles, from Jerusalem. They talked with each other about all the things which happened. While they had talked and questioned together, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, What are you talking about as you walk and are sad? One of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things which have happened there? these days. So real quick, I want to point out two things. Um, First is that their eyes are being kept from recognizing Jesus. Remember, they're not expecting to see Jesus. He's probably fully robed and clothed, so they're not anticipating to see him. Uh, But the point is that God must open our eyes. Our eyes must be opened by the Holy Spirit uh, to understand who Christ is, to see Christ as our Savior, as Lord, to recognize him. Secondly, we know that these things were not done under a rock, so to speak. When Jesus makes a statement to them, they answer him, you know, basically, are you the only person that hasn't heard of these things? So when people try and claim, you know, that Jesus never existed or, you know, all these stories were made up afterwards, uh, we see this just simply isn't true. It's, it, these stories are well extant. Even a lot of the Jewish writers, Josephus and others, uh, mention Christ, mention this, you know, they're they're captured by Rome after the destruction of the temple, and they're writing, you know, stuff that happened 40 years ago, but they're writing about Jesus, who wasn't like their contemporary, because they're younger, right? But they're writing about the fact that he was there and what happened, and in, in, in the sense of what they have heard. And so we see these things aren't just cleverly invented stories, as Paul says, but he was eyewitnesses. There were over 500 eyewitnesses to testify, if, if you know, 500 believers, you know, if not more, uh, from the world. So, so he said to them, what things? Jesus answers that. They said to him, the things concerning Jesus of the Nazarene, who was a mighty prophet in deed and word before God and all people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Remember, they're still seeing Jesus likely only as a prophet. Uh, They don't understand the full extent of what just happened. They think he was a prophet, perhaps the Messiah, but they're still thinking in earthly terms that Christ was a prophet and he came to perhaps establish a Jewish uh, theocracy rather than to die for the sins of the world, rather than to reveal God's ultimate plan for humanity. So So they have it in part, but not in full. Um, but we were hoping, this is what they tell Jesus, but we were hoping that he was he who would redeem Israel, meaning overthrow the Romans, restore the, the Jewish government. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Also certain women of our company amazed us, having arrived early at the tomb. And when they didn't find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of us went to the tomb and found it just like the women had said, but they didn't see him. So they're marveled at what's going on, but they're kind of like, we don't know what's going on, but we don't want to jump to conclusions. You know, just because he said he's going to rise from the dead, we need to see him. We need to see more proof. So the the disciples weren't naive men either that just were just hoping for the best. And, you know, they, oh, no, the the, the tomb's gone. Yes, he rose from the dead. They don't don't immediately jump there. They'll kind of figure out, okay, what's going on? You know, we don't want to just jump to the assumption that he rose from the dead. So wouldn't we see him? Wouldn't he have rode in on a horse and taken Jerusalem and uh, taken it by storm? Because they have the wrong expectation of why he rose from the dead, of of who he was supposed to be, right? They haven't, as I said, in part, but not in full. So Jesus says to them, uh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Christ have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Beginning from Moses and from all the prophets, he explained to them the scriptures, 
the things concerning himself. So Jesus takes the time here to go through the whole Old Testament and show how all of it, all of the law and the prophets pointed to him. They came near to the village where they were going, and he acted like he would go further. Now remember, they still don't realize who Jesus is. They just see him as one who has expounded the scriptures and the meaning of Christ. So they're like, wow, this guy really, how's this guy getting all that we missed in the Old Testament? This guy really knows his word. That's the assumption, right? They urged him saying, stay with us for it is almost evening and the day is almost over. He went in to stay with them. And when he had sat down at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, breaking it, and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. So it's not until God allows their eyes to be opened to truly see who he is, that they understood who they were talking with and what they were dealing with. Now notice what they say. They said to one another, weren't our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us along the way, while he opened the scriptures to us? They rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 gathered together and those who were with them saying, the Lord is risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. They related the things that happened along the way and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. Jesus, as they said these things, uh, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were terrified and filled with fear. So now they're in, they're, they've left and went to Jerusalem. So this is a different scene, just to make sure we understand that. So they go to Jerusalem. Jesus uh, reappears. He had just disappeared. He reappears and says, Peace be with you. But they were terrified and filled with fear and supposed they had seen a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is truly me. Touch me and see, for spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still didn't believe for, while they still didn't believe for joy and wondered, he said to them, Do you have anything here to eat? So we'll come back to that. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. He took them and ate it in front of them. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you, that all these things which are written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds that they might understand the scriptures. So he had been explaining this stuff to them, but they're still having a hard time grasping it. They're still like, well, maybe he's a spirit, and then he like, look at my hands and feet, and they're just still not fully grasping. Let me eat something. Can a spirit eat, right? But now he opens their mind to not only understand what's going on in the scene here, but to understand the scriptures, to understand all that he had been explaining to them. Thus, uh, so he opens their minds, and it says, he says to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So he's explaining this is the master plan of God, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So now the, the picture is beyond Jerusalem. He's not taken back Jerusalem as king. He's taken back the world as king through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the gospel, through remission of sins, and is established a heavenly kingdom. And our prayer, as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this kingdom has been established by Christ and has been building for 2,000 years as he's already ruling and reigning from heaven and establishes heavenly kingdom. And he has sent us here to establish his earthly kingdom, which he will come and consummate. But we got to remember, it's not simply an earthly temporal kingdom that he wants to establish. It's an eternal one, not through power of government rule, but through the power of the gospel, through forgiveness of sins. And then he says, he tells them it's going to start in Jerusalem, but it's going to go out into all the world. And he says, you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send you out the promise of my Father on you, but wait into the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And what he means there is he's pr prophesying of uh, the day of Pentecost when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will be poured out upon them. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, wasn't there with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen our Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of nails, and my hand into his side, I will not believe. So basically, unless I see the, the nails in his hands and feet and put my hands in his side, I'm not going to believe that there is a story. I think you guys just 
want to believe, you know, to make yourself happy. So you got to remember, these guys were, were very skeptical, right? They, they didn't believe Peter at first when Peter said he saw him. Like, well, Peter, man, we know you really loved him and you betrayed him and, and you just you, you want to believe that. It's wishful thinking. And then they see him and they tell Thomas and he's like, shoot. I mean, cool story, man. But unless he shows up to me, I'm not going to believe it. Uh, after eight days, his disciples were inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came. The doors were being locked and stood in the middle of them and said, peace to you. Shows up again, claiming peace. He is the Prince of Peace, right? Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and see my hands. Reach your hand and put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Now we see a revelation. Now we see Jesus went from being a great teacher and prophet as they saw him on the road to, uh, on the road to Emmaus to Thomas having the revelation that he's not only a prophet, but my Lord and my God. And he bows before Jesus in shame for not believing. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. And really that's a testament to us all, right? As we believe the gospel, gospel message, God's Christ's blessing be upon us. Therefore, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Do we have life in his name? Meaning, is our life defined by Christ? Is everything in our world uh, focused and centered and uh, gives meaning by the gospel, by Jesus Christ? Because it should. Our life should really be in his life. Because true life is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a blessed day. We'll see you tomorrow.